Entire cities in the UK are now Wi-Fi hotspots, 11 of them in all, and the number's growing. Liverpool, Manchester, Edinburgh, Brighton, the city of London. Some run by BT, others by a company called The Cloud. And when you're outdoors, the radiation is becoming increasingly difficult to avoid. Five miles outside Norwich, and not a sniff of a connection. In the suburbs, a flicker of a signal, probably from people's home Wi-Fi routers. And in the city centre... There you go. It looks like we've got completely cable-free connectivity. But others would say this makes Norwich a city of virtual smog. Norwich was the first UK city to pilot a government-funded wireless network. In other cities, it's BT and the cloud charging users. But the government was so keen on Wi-Fi, it launched the Norwich service for free. You can see the mini-masts, or nodes, 200 of them in all, which sustain the network and create a pool of connectivity. We went around the city centre with a radiation monitor. Went into the red there. We're getting quite high readings here. They're about three or four times higher than we got at the mobile phone mast in the main beam of it. And uh, people are walking up and down here. They won't know it. And uh, I mean, it could be because of that. There's a little node up there on the top of the lamppost. It's something that's made their MP worried. He was a biologist and cancer specialist for 40 years before entering politics and feels his own party is now ignoring the advice they themselves commissioned. How seriously do you think the government's taking the precautionary approach right now with respect to Wi-Fi? Oh, I don't think there's any, any doubt about it. They're not at all. Wi-Fi is just being rolled out as the great big white heat of technology. Industry rules in this area and uh, the precautionary principle and the safety of people who might benefit to some extent from the technologies are completely dismissed. It's just it's wild west country for the companies. They just put them where they want and uh, say there's no evidence. Now, you know, five, ten years from now as the evidence grows, there's enough now to be worried about, but as the evidence grows, who knows what it might show. It might show that it's completely unsafe for certain groups of people. But whilst the government races ahead, apparently unrestrained by its own chief advisor, others are more cautious. Switzerland, Italy, Russia, China, all have exposure limits thousands of times below ours. In Salzburg, the government advises against Wi-Fi in schools altogether. And there's something special happening in Sweden. We've flown in with our electrosensitive Sylvia. Our government doesn't acknowledge her condition, but here it's different. Deep in the Swedish woods, the hideaway of another woman called Sylvia. Hello. Hello. Welcome. It's me. You're Welcome. Right. Can we come and have a look around? Yes. She's an electrosensitive too, and so are several of her friends. Can you feel anything here? I don't feel anything here. All what I feel is just uh, me. Here, actually, I could just uh, think about other things, you know. It's just, just nice. It's just, yeah. uh, um, mm. you know, I feel free. So when did the authorities here start acknowledging the existence of this? They did so in 2003. Uh, they, then they said this is uh, an official disability. A disability? Yes. The Swedish government estimates that 3% of the population suffer this disability. Translate that to the UK and it's about 2 million people. Yet as far as our government's concerned, there are none. We set off for Stockholm and Swedish Sylvia's city centre flat. She's plotted a route to avoid all the masks. She wants to show us just how seriously her government takes her condition. Like the UK, this is a place where more and more people are acquiring Wi-Fi. 
but there's a key difference. Okay, Sylvia. Ah. This is my living room. And today the painter has been here. And you see he has started painting black. And this is anti-radiation paint? Yes. It's quite expensive. It's very expensive. Anti-radiation paint paid for by the local authority. It shields her from neighbours' Wi-Fi and from nearby phone masts. So the Swedes have the same scientific evidence, but they recognise sufferers. In Swedish schools, even if there's only one person apparently affected by Wi-Fi, the system's removed and the classroom shielded. You'd think our government would base its decisions on the advice of their top man, the one it employed to protect our health, Sir William Stewart. But instead, it seems to have turned to others. First, the World Health Organization. It's robust in its language, saying there are no adverse health effects from low-level, long-term exposure. Is that an accurate reflection of the science, do you think? I think they are wrong. How are they wrong? Because, the, because there is evidence. And the Stuart report pointed out some of that evidence. So why do you think it is that the WHO, one of the most influential public health bodies in the world, continues to put out that message? I think that they, they've got to review the statement that they're making. But in your view, not an accurate reflection of the science that's out there? I think it is not an accurate reflection. Then, there's this. It's unlikely you'll have heard of ICNERP, but it's an international group of scientists which our government relies on to set our radiation limits. But here's the problem. It doesn't recognize any biological effects, so it bases our exposure limits on a thermal effect. In other words, the radiation has to be so strong it heats up your organs before it's restricted. That's why our safety limits are so high. How responsible do you think it is for governments to set limits for this form of radiation according only to a thermal effect? Uh, well, I think it's irresponsible to, to just set standard using a thermal standard. If you just set it based on the thermal effect, you're regretting a large uh, amount of data. Most countries, including the UK, set their radiation limits according to the ICNERP guidelines. They can't be wrong, can they? Well, hopefully not, because as you say, governments, and in that way, whole countries, the entire populations rely upon them, and I do hope that they deliver the right and correct message. However, uh, I know also that they are heavily industry influenced, and I mean, their basic message is that if you are below a certain thermal level, then it's all right. And, uh, are, th are they right to set their guidelines only according to thermal effects? No, 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 no. That's just rubbish, I would say. You know, you cannot uh, put any uh, emphasis on such uh, guidelines. So, why do we? I went to Rome to meet the man our government seems to favour over its own advisor, Sir William Stewart. He's a scientist who's responsible for the WHO's position and who founded the standard-setting body, ICNERP. He's a controversial character. Dr. Mike Repacholi no longer works for the WHO, but he's made decisions which affect all our lives. When you say on the WHO website there are no known adverse health effects, is that really giving people a complete picture of the science out there? When, when that statement was put on the website, it was meaning that there was no health effects have been established. And when an effect has been established, it means it's been repeated in a number of laboratories using very good study techniques. But Henry Lai will say that he's found them. Olli Johansson will say he's found them. I mean, there are a number of, of, of highly esteemed scientists who say they have found them well beneath those levels. Are they wrong? If they've published, they are in the mix because every review panel looks at all the studies along with other studies to see if they're comparable with those studies or point in the same direction. It's called a weight of evidence approach. And if that weight of evidence is not for there being an effect or not being an effect, 
That's the only way you can tell whether there's really an adverse health effect. But here's the controversy. Dr. Repicholi used to work for the very industry which helps create this form of radiation. Before working for the WHO, he'd been an expert witness for the phone industry, defending their right to site masts in controversial locations. Are you truly independent, do you think, as a scientist? Well, I, I don't know how people perceive me. I perceive myself. You know, I think you do know how people no, perceive me. No, I, I do. I've seen the websites. And people can say what they like. I know what I am. I will only say what the science says. And that's, to me, that's an independent view. If people perceive it differently, so be it. You did, didn't you, work for industry uh, before the WHO and ICNA? I did. And you worked for them afterwards as well? I did. And I challenge anyone to say that I've changed my mind because of my funder. Because I sure as hell haven't. So our government has a choice. Follow the recommendations of scientists like Dr. Repicholi and the WHO, who effectively say, roll it out and don't stop unless someone proves there's a risk. Or follow their own advisor, who says, hold on, don't rush ahead until we know for sure it's safe. Until that's resolved, is it our kids who've become the test bed? Would you allow your children uh, to sit in front of a Wi-Fi enabled computer day in day out as they're going to school? That's a tough question. <laughs> I, say, uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I would limit the exposure to this type of uh, radiation. I would recommend to parents to tell the school to remove Wi-Fi and otherwise I would change the school even. Really? You take it that seriously? Yes, very. If you had kids who were at a school at the moment and there was Wi-Fi being rolled out, any concern at all? None whatsoever. I'd make sure they had laptops and they could pick it up. What do you think the government should do now when it comes to schools and Wi-Fi? I think they should stop and say we're going to do an inquiry into this, it'll take a year or two years, then we'll come back to it. I don't think the nation will grind to a halt if we did that. I think it would convince a lot of people that the government takes health and safety very seriously with new technologies. We asked the government for an interview about all this. It said no, and referred us instead to the Health Protection Agency. The chairman of that is Sir... Hang on a minute. It's Sir William Stewart. The very man who's indicated to Panorama just how uncomfortable he feels about the speed with which Wi-Fi is being rolled out. I believe that there is a need for a review of the Wi-Fi and other areas. How important is it to do that swiftly? I think it's timely for it to be done now. If it's not? Who knows? Paul Kenyon there, and the UK has 3,000 wireless hotspots and 51,000 mobile phone masts, and more and more are appearing every week. Next week, it's married to the mob, the Manchester woman convicted of helping to run a Sicilian husband's mafia empire.